Welcome to Hockey Night in New York, where Islanders hockey always reigns supreme. Whether you were raised at the barn in Uniondale or born in the stable at Belmont, Hockey Night in New York is your home for all things Isles. Now, let's drop the puck and get this party started. Ladies and gentlemen, it is Hockey Night in New York. Welcome to the program, everyone. It is Saturday, March 9th, 2024. Coming at you live from Floored Media in Rockville Center. Got a special edition of Hockey Night in New York coming up for you tonight. California Stefan Rosner will be joining me all the way from the West Coast covering the New York Islanders as they play the Ducks tomorrow, the Kings Monday. But we'll, of course, get into that. Callie Stefan, how we doing, pal? You can't tell by the glasses. I'm feeling great. Buddy, um, you look you great. Know, sunglasses inside is usually frowned upon. Uh, but for the show and given the promo that we had out there with me wearing sunglasses, I thought, you know what? It'd be fitting if I kept the shades on. I love it. I love the fun participation here. How was the birthday? Oh, birthday was fantastic. I had a hockey game that night, and usually I lose my birthday. Um, and I didn't. So that's a plus. For Look sure. at you, Powell. Happy birthday. Things are turning up. Thanks for joining us on the West Coast. I'm sure the sun is still out over there. But, uh, oh, it is shining. I yes. <laughs> love it. So before we dive in, everything going to rattle off our wonderful sponsors, starting with Blue Line Deli and Bagel. Satisfy your hunger at 719 West Jericho Turnpike in Huntington and 217 Carlton Avenue in East Islip. Check out the menu and order online at bluelinedeli.com. Also happy to be sponsored by Main Street Board Game Cafe. Find your crowd and unplug your game at 307 Main Street in Huntington Village. Also happy to be sponsored by Razor and Kniff Attorneys at Law, ready to fight for you. Check them out at Razor and Kniff dot com that is r-a-i-s-e-r-a-n-d-k-e-n-n-i-f-f dot com for a free consultation and also happy to be sponsored by a1 vip entertainment your one-stop entertainment concierge for sports concerts broadway and more one call does it all at 516-787-0048 and folks, if you have questions for Questions Brewing, just remember to preface your chat with Questions Brewing. Ask your question, and then we will get into it. And before we get into the content here, Edzo is on the he's on the mend right now. None of the men. He had a prior engagements, but we have Jake the Snake over here joining. And Jake, how are we doing, buddy? I'm doing great. I'm just taking Ed's job. You doing know? a little pinch hit, and I love it. <laughs> yeah, a little pinch hit. You know, get some baseball terms out there for me. <laughs> <laughs> very nice, very nice. So uh, you're there with Jay. That's how's Jay doing over there? He's smiling, so that's a good sign. That's that's rare, so that's a that's a good sign. But uh, <laughs> Stefan, let's dive into the week that was here. Obviously, you get another two game for the Islanders, and the the winning streak continues. They're at five now, hoping to make it six tomorrow. Why don't we start over in St. Louis? What you see in that game, and we'll go from there. Yeah, I thought that was another game where the Islanders were going up against a backup, and I feel like that's me in my seat. That's hysterical. Um, but uh, yeah, <laughs> you're going against a backup, and you thought, okay, last night played. The Blues, it was about getting into Biddington's head. And then, okay, crashing it against this guy, Hoffer. Um, and the honors go down. 2 nothing. It's one of those games where you're thinking, what is going on with Bo Horvat, right? It's one of those, yes, one of those games where he, he is not playing the way that you expect. Again, Bo Horvat's been great. He's going to make mistakes. It happens. But the two mistakes he makes put the honors down in a hole, 2 nothing, And you're thinking, this is a game they can't afford to lose. They can't afford to lose any games at this point. But, you know, this is one of those you're at home. You're playing again. Good start. You're playing well. Two bad mistakes. One, trying to do too much at the blue line, leading to an odd man rush the other way. The other one, just thought he had way too much time in front of Sorokin, gets his pocket picked, and then it's a tap in at the back door. And you're thinking, all right, if the Islanders are going to win this game, we got to see guys step up. And you saw that. Yeah. Um, and Bo Horvat after the game, I think, is the most important thing is just the accountability from this guy. One, obviously, he gets the eventual game winner on a nifty wraparound goal after the Islanders do find a way to tie it. I think that was what. Six minutes into the third. Um, beautiful play. Uh, 55 seconds. Into the yeah, third, actually. 55 seconds. Yeah. Um, so the Islanders find a way to win that game. And then after the game, all Hart was saying was, good on my team. It's picking me up. Those two goals are on me. And and Waz not going to ever say it's, it's one player's fault. He said, you know, we could have helped them out more in those situations. But speaks about Bo's character for the way he came out after the game. And Because, again, they won the game. He didn't have to be accountable at all. all right, I made mistakes. won the game. It doesn't really matter. But he didn't even get asked. It was just him automatically being accountable. He gets the big-time goal. He gets goals by Palmieri and Pajot, right? And that one as yes. well. So you saw that line you know, step up big-time for this team. 
Yeah, you talk about stepping up, and you, you look at the last game against the Blues, and they give those three quick goals up, and, and they didn't have an answer for it, right? They end up going down in that one, despite the effort. They they did play a decent game, but this time, they go down two goals, and they kind of pick each other up by their bootstraps, and uh, the second line comes up huge. Paggio and Paul Mary, like you said, they get some big goals to tie that game before the second period's over, and then 55 seconds in, Bo Horvat gets the winner, and that's a, that's a character win for this team. It's a way to get another two points on the board. That's a way to keep this streak going and then that has them riding high into the final game on Thursday where they head out to San Jose and uh, another encouraging sign for this team because you know I think a lot of people I said it on Twitter too you know going into this game might have been like okay this could be a struggle we obviously remember what happened last time when they went up on the Sharks they go up in this game it stays tight for a little while, but as far as what was happening on the ice, the Islanders pretty much took it to them, and I think that's the the most encouraging sign is that this is a team now who's focused on making the playoffs. They have some paths there, and we'll talk about that in a little bit, but they didn't take the foot off the gas, right? They played a, a, right. a team who just lost Anthony du- Duclair. They were depleted as it is, and they, they took care of business, 7-2 drubbing, and now you got the winning streak at 5, and they have a huge opportunity to make 12 out of 12 points tomorrow when they face Anaheim. Yeah, that game against the Sharks was huge because, again, it could have been one of those quote-unquote trap games that we always talk about where this is a team that's done that to a lot of bad teams and plays down to their opponents. I didn't particularly love the first period. Um, I thought they you know, they allowed the San Jose Sharks way too many chances. Sorokin was too busy, but, you know, it's the Sharks. They don't give up – they don't – excuse me, they don't stop goals. They give up a lot of goals. Right. And all the Islanders had to do was just keep going, and eventually you'll, you'll find a way to get them in now. There are a couple of shots, like Dobson's pass goes in, Anders Lee bank off skate – but you had some really nice goals, like Romanov off the rush. Yeah. I feel like we've said that a lot more this year than we've ever said with him, especially since Waugh's taken over. Like, these off-the-rush chances from the defenders changes everything for what this Islanders offense could do. And again, you kept going. Every time that – the biggest thing that Waugh said after the game, and the players said it too, is that we had an answer for every goal they scored. In the past, it could have been where the Islanders go up 2 nothing in a game like that, and they allow a goal. Then they allow another one. Then they're chasing. I and mean, we saw it against the San Jose Sharks team. And there was no answer for the Islanders every time San Jose scored. Whereas in this game, every time they scored, whether it was a minute or two minutes later, I think they scored what? They scored four goals in 501 right. of action. I mean, they just kept going, kept going, and found a way to just blow them out. And at the end of the day, too, like Romanov made a mistake on one of the goals. And again, accountability with this group. You know, not saying that Watt came in and that every player was accountable, but Watt coming in to be accountable has made Barzal and Horvat more accountable, which in part is the teammates seeing that their captain and their leaders are being more accountable. Well, they're going to be more accountable. Romanov, after the game, maybe it was more of a joking manner, but he's like, yeah, like, I made a bad play on that. And I like, got me scoring. Like, that was a way for me to be more accountable and really get pick myself up, I guess, for the mistake I made. But he kept going back to, like, yeah, it's a bad play by me, bad play by me, where – that's huge. Even when, again, especially after wins, that's huge. After losses, it's easy. Like you're the spotlight's right. on you for the mistake you made. You have to be accountable at some point if we ask questions. In fact, if these guys are being so accountable, we're not even like talking about it. it speaks volumes to the just what has Waz done to this group. And that there's no, it's not a coincidence that they're winning now. They bought in physically with what Wa wants on the ice. Mentally, they bought in to never give up. But also, they're going to win and lose the team, and they're also going to comment each other when they pick each other up and I think this is this team has never seemed closer to me than they are right now yeah and let's let's talk about that it looks like this team is finally finding its stride under Patrick Waugh and obviously it took you know some 500 hockey out of the gate before it seems like they really got there but you know you see this winning streak they're beating teams you know in all parts of the standings of the league right they're not just beating the San Jose Sharks of the league right they, they have some big wins Boston Bruins you look back Dallas and it looks like this is a team who's finally you know got, kind of gotten the wind behind the sails with uh with Patrick Wild leading the ship here and um you know let's talk about how that's going to factor into looking ahead you have three different pathways to get into the playoffs when you look at the two wild card spots held by Detroit and Tampa. You have, obviously, Philadelphia in third place uh, in the Metropolitan Division. But maybe just talk a little bit about, like, why this team or how this team has finally kind of progressed into buying into Patrick's system and looking like they're they're performing it every night and they have a chance for success now, it looks like, pretty much every night. Yeah, I think you look at the first week under Wild, where at first practice, I feel like players bought in, but it goes from progression to execution. We talk about this a lot on the show. And the first week under Wild, you saw that progression, one, two, and one, but you weren't seeing the execution. And then you come out of the All-Star break, you win a couple, lose a couple. It was just back and forth. The, the players still believe, like, this is the way we have to do it. And Wild wasn't going to change his plan. 
And now you're just seeing the progression is becoming execution. Every player is executing. Everyone's picking each other up. It doesn't matter if they're trailing in a game or up early. Like they know how to play now. Where they're, it's hard when you're you're trying so hard and you see like okay we're playing better and the results aren't coming. I think Palmieri spoke about that after the St. Louis game where like finally their results are are coming now and it's a great feeling obviously when you're Palmieri's been excellent things like that. But you're just seeing everyone buy in and it, it helps when you're playing a team like the San Jose Sharks to build up confidence where pretty much every time you shoot it it's probably going in um but you're just seeing over this win streak that it doesn't matter who they're playing because they're not focused on their opponent the whole goal for the honor is that if they play their game other team isn't and i think romanov mentioned that after last game that you know we had an answer of every goal but we just focused on playing our game going forward talking to the players today it's you know it's the ducks they're bad they've struggled but we play our game that that means the other team's not playing theirs and i think that's why they're winning so much now even if they're trailing in games once they get to their game it's overwhelming and teams, you know, I just want to go through a couple of stats here. They've played 17 games since Waz come in nine, five and three. And if you look at what's changed, especially at five on five, I mean, shots against per 60, uh, they're towards the top, top five in that um, shots against, I'm sorry, goals against per 60. They're at the top. They're expected goals against at the top best in the league in that regard as well. So you're just looking at everyone's buying in, which in part, we've talked a lot about how much stress, Elias Sorokin's been on since, you know, pretty much since Trotz left. And and now with the five on five, the way they're playing, he doesn't have to be the star of every game. He doesn't have to be a third star of every game. I wrote about it. We talked about how he's an X factor. Like just because he has to do his job now, which should also relieve Alamov when he's going to start, by the way, against Anaheim, where he hasn't played since the first St. Louis game. You know, that means there's going to be a little bit of rust. If the honors can, hey, here's a shot from the outside. You're not going to have high danger chances up the wazoo every second, like we saw. In his first game against Montreal, I mean, the Islanders didn't play at all in front of him. He got lit lit up early in that game before the Islanders came back and then the Engvall mistake. But it's very important for a goalie coming in that's been sitting to not get 10 high danger chances right off the bat. Let him settle in. So I think the way Waz built is going to take pressure off Sorokin, which means you could rely on him more down the stretch. Whereas last year, it was chaos, chaos, chaos. And you essentially killed Sorokin before the games mattered, quote unquote mattered. So yeah, everything the Islanders have done at five on five, the power play has been solid. The penalty kills looked a little better over the mm-hmm. street. They're definitely more structured. I'm pretty sure they've only allowed two power play goals against, I believe, two or three. I think it's three now after the San Jose game. But everything is going in the right direction. They just have to find a way to keep it going. For sure. And you bring up Sorok, and I'm glad you did. So give me your goaltender's perspective here. Obviously, you just spoke about how the team's playing in front of him. But have you seen any difference in, in Sorokin's game since Patrick Waugh's taken over now? Yeah, playing the puck. Um, he is playing the puck a lot more. And that's not to say that he's going to be like Igor Shesterkin where he's going to legitimately lead a transition sure. by tossing the puck up the ice. But you saw it a lot. You saw it. And again, he's going to have issues getting used to it. But Wa said, and I spoke to Sorokin about how Wa is pushed for both goalies. They're practicing it every day to, to stop the, the ring around the boards. Slow the puck down behind the zone. If you could pass it off to a D-man, do it as quick as possible. Eliminate the stress there. And you're seeing Sorokin come out, be more aggressive, maybe at times a little too much, which for me as a goalie, if you're not a good handling, if you're not good at handling the puck, you should stay in your net. But at the same time, the way the, today's NHL, the game is, it's all based on speed. And if, if you could stop the puck and let your defense with stride pick it up rather than have to stop it and change direction and slow the game down, if you can keep the puck moving and the transition going, it's such a beneficial thing, for especially for a team that's now built on acting the defense and being such a transitional team. If your goalie is not coming out to help you in that, it takes you more time to get up the ice. So I think you're seeing Sorokin do that a lot more. We spoke to Varlamov who said, you know, he's not the best goaltender handling the puck, but he's worked on it. And it's an important part of what Wa wants. So that's what, that's the biggest thing I've seen in Sorokin's game. I don't love a couple of the goals he has allowed mm-hmm. under Wa. It seems like every game that he's played, maybe one is a weakness. But at the same time, when you're scoring five goals a game, you could do that. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up because now that the shot totals against are going down a little bit, I'm curious to see if if Sorokin's performance or even just his numbers improve because I think there was some gray area earlier in the season, particularly during the the Lane Lambert games, was because the shot totals against were just you know up up towards the top almost every night, right? And it was almost yep. like you gave you gave Sorokin a break because he's facing 35, 40 shots a night, and you're like one's bound to go in no matter how good you are, right? And now with the shot totals against coming down, with the attack zone time for the Islanders going up. Um, I'm waiting to see or hoping to see that Sorokin starts to make more of those saves that, you know, you would expect him to see when he doesn't get that that glut of shots as he had been earlier in the season. 
Yeah, and that's why I say, you know, he's the X factor for them to make the playoffs, but not because he has to be a superstar. Make the saves you have to make. I, I spoke about, I think, last week where you look at Grice and Leonard's Jennings Trophy year. Neither goalie's an elite goalie, but when you allow shots from the outside, all of Leonard and Grice, again, maybe, of course, they had to make big saves probably at times, but more often than not, the shots are from the outside. If they did their job, they're winning the game. And right now with the way the Islanders are playing offensively and scoring goals and the way they're playing defensively, they just need Sorokin to make the saves he has to make. And of course, at times, obviously, bail them out when they can. But he doesn't have to be elite goaltender Ilya Sorokin for the Islanders to make the playoffs. He just has to do his job and not allow those weak shots to go in. Yeah, if he needs to save being elite for the playoffs, that's fine. <laughs> as long as they get it. <laughs> yeah. But but let's pivot now over to deadline day. Let's talk about Friday. Obviously, yep. a, a quiet day for Lou Lamarillo and the Islanders. I know there were some some folks out there that were hoping for maybe adding something here, even if it was a depth depth piece. You and I going in kind of said it might be difficult just given the cap constraints. Even you know putting Scott Mayfield on the LTIR. Uh, it sounds like Lou was on the phones. He was trying to make something happen. He even went so far as to say that the first rounder was was on the table if the right deal was there. But ultimately, nothing happened. So my first question for you with regards to that is, is that a mistake? Is, did the Islanders need to do something on Friday? Yeah. Um, In my opinion, it was a mistake not adding if you could. Now, if Lou was out there trying to get a player. Mm -hmm. Now, for example, I know for a fact there was interest with Savard in Montreal. But the Montreal Canadiens were asking just, they wanted a first for him. Um, And given that the Islanders don't need pretty much term, on a defense when they bring in just because Mayfield's going to be back. Um, they're probably going to re-sign uh, uh, Riley at some point. We don't like, you don't need a guy like that for next year. You have Mayfield coming back. Um, I thought it was, you know, if you go and get Savard shot blocking, I mean, he plays Mayfield's role, but not for, you don't have to overpay for that. So I think there were ways for Lou to probably get a player mm-hmm. to help the, out the back end. And I just think, again, if one guy goes down, now, I don't know if there's mm-hmm. trust in Bolduc. He went down to Bridgeport for conditioning stint. Ajo has been great with Riley, but Bortuzzo has already suffered a setback with this high ankle sprain. Oh, really? He should be ready to go in a couple of days. Okay. But, you know, he didn't come back because of the high ankle sprain. He's 34 mm-hmm. years old. If he can't come, let's say he suffers another setback, your options now to replace Mayfield or Samuel Boldig if another defenseman goes down. Mm-hmm. Um, what do you do? You don't have, I mean, sure, you have Grant Hudden and Bridgeport. I thought with the 1.58, whatever it is in cap space after they activate Bortuzzo, it maybe would have made sense to just grab another NHL ready player but at the same time even in Barry Trotz said the asking prices were ridiculous um so if Lou right. thought hey I could get a guy but you know hopefully Bortuzzo comes back he's healthy we have Bulldog I'm not going to overpay for a player that I need for the next 25 games maybe the playoffs so if there was way to add I think it was a mistake to not go get a dead uh, depth defenseman but if the asking prices were as high as everyone was saying it was mm-hmm. I have no issues with Lou standing pat especially with the way their team's playing yeah and maybe Watt today said um yeah, keep going. And maybe it wasn't even so much a mistake in the sense that if he was going for it and he couldn't make it happen, that's one thing, right? Uh, I'm sure, like you said, there was some interest there in Montreal. Maybe he just get, couldn't get the right package going, get the right deal going, you know, working the cap, getting the right assets going the other way, what, whatever it is. But, you know, you and I had thought that a depth defenseman was probably going to be something he looked at. And unfortunately, I guess that's something that just didn't work out. Were you surprised that there were no signings announced, particularly Riley? Yeah, um, I've written about it the morning of that, you know, we are heard that uh, contract sentences were happening. You see it around the deadline day. People do that. Barry Trotz did like five of them. But um, for Riley, he's been so good that you think a contract's coming. Or, you know what, it always could be done and they're not saying anything either. Um, but I think it was interesting if you listen to the words of Lou. Not only did he say there were no contracts to announce, but none have been discussed. And forget about Riley for a second. Again, we expect him to probably get a one or two year extension around uh one to 2.5 million a year because the cash is going up and he's been good mm-hmm. but again matt martin and cal clutter being pending ufa is the fact that again per lieu no contract talks have even been discussed i do think that's kind of yeah. i think that says a lot without saying a lot interesting um just because again i i do believe that if clutterbuck he's been healthy all year if he wants to come back in a league minimum deal great same thing with matt martin even if he's not going to play every day if you have the cap space i don't think they're going to go anywhere else clearly they weren't Right. But the conversation was, hey, we're going right. to trade you or do you want to be moved? They're winning right now, and they're both playing. Um, if one of them was a healthy scratch, and maybe they asked to be moved. But I did think it was interesting that none of that was being discussed. Like, Luke could have said there's word contracts being discussed, and it, you avoid that entirely. 
So the fact that he said that no contracts were discussed yet mm. says a lot more than anything. Maybe that kind of does mean that, hey, we're going to evaluate Martin and Clutch, which he should. Obviously, he shouldn't lock himself into things right now if he doesn't have to. But I did think it was interesting the wording that Lou said. But I would expect Riley's going to get one. He's just okay. been he's been too good in such an integral piece where um, that shouldn't be the case. Outside of that, too, you look at the move that Lou made to get him. I mean, that's probably one. If you look around the league most impactful waiver pickups of the year. I mean, you got you to gotta think he's up there. 15 points through 41 games. So full season there, if he keeps that pace up, that's a 30-point season. So that's a great ad for them on, just on the offensive production end of things, right? But I think you're you're correct in just talking about uh, Matt Martin and Cal Clutterbuck in that there's really no urgency to, to start those conversations, those contract talks, because they're probably going nowhere else other than the Islanders, most likely. Uh, so I think that's something that Lou can kind of wait on, and I think those are two guys willing to give Lou some time before even you know, kind of opens up those conversations. But I was a little surprised, um, not shocked, but I was a little surprised maybe an extension for Riley wasn't extended, but maybe that's just something Lou's going to address in the summer as well. Yeah, and then you look too with the deadline is rosters expanding. Um, so people, I don't know if everyone does understand, it's, it's all these complicated rules, but like for Kyle McLean, he can't go now into Bridgeport anymore. He has to remain on the NHL roster, which by the way, he's definitely deserved. So that's oh, yeah. one rule there is he's stuck. Here, players from Bridgeport can come up, but um, I forgot the exact ruling, but the fact that he's on the NHL roster from the deadline, you saw a lot of paper transactions yesterday of players that were AHL guys that just get sent down paper-wise and then called up the next day. As long as by the deadline that they were on their, in an AHL roster, they could still be moved. But the Islanders are as comfortable as ever to not do that with McLean and keep him up here, which goes to show just how much he's earned it and deserved it. And I've heard about it at the Hockey News, a couple, asked a couple Islanders about him, asked why about him spoke to Kyle this morning. He didn't even know the rule. He goes, yeah, my agent texted me and said, this is what's going to happen. I had no idea. I'm happy to be here. Um, also, what this means is that you don't have to be cap compliant by the deadline, but you, right now you don't. Ha- you can have as many players on the NHL roster as you possibly want as long as you are cap compliant. So, for example, is everyone's wondering, you know, why was Rob Bortuzzo not activated yet? You know, mm-hmm. if, if they activate Bortuzzo before the trade deadline, that means they had to create a roster spot. They have the cap space. So now, though, if they waited, like let's say Bortuzzo was ready to go two days ago. Um, there's no point in them having to waive or trade Wallstrom or waive or trade Ajo or whatever they're going to do to make a spot. Wait a couple of days when Bertuzzo is ready now. They have the cap space. They don't have to create a roster spot. He's there to go. So I think like to like Julian Godier, if they have the cap space, he could get recalled. Um, now, again, I don't think Wa, especially how important practices are, learning a new system, wants an overcrowded practice, taking reps away from NHL guys. But they do have the option now to bring a guy like Godier back up or any player they want up as long as they're cap compliant, in which they are right now. There you go. And just to talk about the league a little bit here, what would you think of the moves that were made? A lot of activity. Vegas finding ways to, uh, <laughs> seems to be, circumvent this this cap in the LTIR uh, situation. I didn't get a chance to check when this CBA expires, but I got to figure, just even going back to what Tampa did with Kucherov and all that, that that's going to be re- revisited. I don't think this is something that's going to be able to happen down the road. But uh, who do you think? got strongest over this trade deadline and who's to fear in in the in the playoff picture now yeah i love what florida did um getting tarasenko obviously for what they got him wasn't much but i think everyone that's an islander fan loves that they got kyle Poso. Yeah, sure. and um one of those guys growing up uh for me by far my favorite islander growing up he has the coolest nhl goal i don't want to watch any other people's highlights uh <laughs> on one knee one timer helmetless glove side on board door that's by the way, he would get a penalty today if he even touched the puck with no helmet on. Um, but I think it's one of the core things and just how much he meant to this organization. I feel like when he left, people forgot, not forgot, but it was mm-hmm. like, there was a lot missing from this group when him and uh, Nielsen left and he goes to Buffalo and he hasn't been in the playoffs since 2016. So I spoke to Andrew right. about it this morning. He goes, I love, I love Oki. I guess that was his nickname here about how much of a leader he was. You know, he got snubbed from being on team USA that one year. He never got to wear a C here he was a captain in Buffalo and he's, that's been a tough time in Buffalo for him, especially health for him too. I mean, he had suffered a major injury. Yeah. He was a concussion or an eye injury that ended up in the ICU or whatever. Craziness. The fact that he's still playing now gets to go to Florida. But what Florida, I mean, Florida was already the best team in the league. You get Tarasenko for his goal scoring. He scored, I think, two goals today. You have a poster to play a bottom six leadership role. I love what they did. Um, the Devils, I have no idea what they're doing. <laughs> the whole goaltending thing to me makes yeah, strange. zero sense. Right. Um, especially, I don't know what the Sharks. I don't get started with them. That, what a debacle of a franchise that is. I, the fact that they trade Hurdle, I get that for sure. You want to do right by him. The fact that they gave more picks up with Hurdle and he's on their books to like 2030. Like, not only did they help Hurdle, they, they bent over for Vegas. 
I don't know. What, like, what are we doing? I, um, I don't get that at all. For a team that's rebuilding, you want to, you, you have hurdle and Vegas wants hurdle. You fleece Vegas. Like you make Vegas overpay ridiculously if they really want them. You don't say, here you go on a silver platter at an all you can eat, like Chinese buffet. Like, oh yeah, here, here he is. Just grab him. <laughs> Yeah, I'm with you, man. You know, just the, the the fact that they retained any salary, I think it was only 17%, but over the course of all that time. Why? Right, why, no, why? I mean, yeah, why are they doing that for, for Vegas? And, and, that's, and that kind of goes into a broader thing here that I brought up on Twitter too. Like, I feel like this season, I haven't seen a trade deadline with so many in-division deals, right? So many rivals trading with each other, you know, and it's not just you know, minor transactions where maybe it's just an AHL guy or a guy who's not going to touch the the NHL, the main team or anything like that. Like you got big names like Gensel going to Carolina in division. And and granted, Pittsburgh's obviously saying, hey, look, we're out of it. We don't really care what happens. Let's, let's get some assets for this guy. I understand that. But usually in the past, that's the guy that gets shipped out west. This is, you know what I mean? Like that's mm-hmm. a guy who goes as Yo, we far away about as this. possible. Yeah. And there was just so many deals leading up to Friday where I was like, man, another another pair of rivals here dealing with each other. And I'm curious as to why that's suddenly gone out the window. Yeah, I think it's because of so many players didn't re-sign with their teams or last summer because the cap didn't go up, signed one-year deals. But if they're not signing long-term, like I know for a fact that Gensel hasn't even talked to the Carolina Hurricanes about an extension. He's a pure rental right now. I think for teams trading the division, especially with these guys with the cap going up, mm. that they're, you know, you're not trading them and then they're signing, likely signing eight year deals with that team. Like for the Penguins, they're, I don't know if they play Carolina again, but they're not making the playoffs. Like they don't have to worry about facing Gensel in the playoffs. And I think that's when you get into trouble where, you know, oh, my trading guy early in the year or at the deadline, I got to face him now three times and they might be the reason I missed the playoffs. Mm-hmm. Or they're going to sign there long term and now they're going to bully me for the next eight years. Like I don't think the Penguins traded him to Carolina thinking, He's going to sign and land there. I don't think he's going to end up staying there. Um, but there is a trade I want to touch that didn't happen. And that okay. was with the Boston Bruins. Oh, right. Um, okay. Bru- so it sounds like, I mean, per the reports out there, that the Kings wanted to get Olmark. Um, and to me, if you're trading Olmark and you're the Bruins, you should have done it this past summer mm. after him winning the Vesna. And again, the playoffs weren't great for him and the mistakes that he made. But that team in general, they placed Florida, which, by the way, Florida wasn't an eight seed or last, like they weren't that they were just a really good team that caught fire too late. Now we're seeing this year, but LA wanted Omar and it turns Mm. out that he denied it, or it seems like he denied it because he didn't want to go to LA. One of those teams on his no trade. But the funniest part about this is the player that was going to, one of the players going back the other way was Pierre-Luc Dubois. So already LA, which by the way, forcing a a, a player that, that could force themselves around the league, like, it seemed like Pierre Luc Dubois was LeBron, and he's not even <laughs> right, close to being right. a, like an elite player yeah. in this league. That he was forcing his well, I'm going to LA and things like that. And you look at the players that Winnipeg got back that are already playing like stat wise are much better than what Dubois has done. And Dubois has really hurt LA given his play. And that already they're trying to ship him off. To me, it's like you, you know you made your bed, you lined it. I don't know why you felt like you needed to get Pierre Luc Dubois if you're mm-hmm. where LA. Um, but that's a trade that didn't happen. That seemed like it was really close to happening. Maybe maybe Allmark's not a fan of LA traffic. I didn't see that it was LA that was the other team. I just saw that Allmark had turned down the the oh, trade. So I believe it. I, it looked like I think some a couple of Twitter accounts reported that there was something going on, or one of the insiders between LA and Boston. So I'm I'm assuming it was LA. I mean, gotcha. they can use that. Talbot's been all right, but I feel bad for um, Swayman though. That's a mental uh, day for him. I mean, how close him and Allmark are. At least Allmark had a say in what happened. Swayman's probably going. Am I going to lose my best friend? I guess it's a double-edged sword because, yeah, A, he loses his buddy, but on the other side, Boston's saying, hey, you're our guy. We believe in you. You're going to lead us that's to the true. promised land. You know? So that, That's a fair point. But, yeah, I thought the deadline was – it was interesting. It was a lot of the moves, again, too, with like, well, this player is going for this value, but now mm-hmm. the same type of player is going for something completely different. Like, I didn't love the return the Penguins got for Gensel. Mm-hmm. Um and like just even talking when we were on this last week when we were talking about the show, like Labushkin going for what he went for in Tana. It's sure. just it's so weird how things didn't really match up. Right, right. And then you have Declare going to Tampa Bay. So I guess indirectly that affects the Isles just because we we threw him out there as a name that maybe a guy who the, yep. the Islanders could land. Also a team they're gonna be vying for a playoff spot with. You look at Carolina now, we mentioned Gensel, they also got Kuznetsov Kuznetsov, another interdivision trade here with Washington. And then you have the Rangers, who, if you just want to look at the cross town, town rival, they get Wenberg, and they get a couple of depth depth pieces. What did you think of those moves? 
Yeah, um, I think Weinberg's a solid player for them. I know Islander fans were interested in him. He's mm-hmm. a very bad penalty killer, and he's winning under 50% of his draws. So if the Islanders thought Weinberg was your answer at TC, probably not. And again, they didn't give up a first-round pick for him, and there was side retention there. But for the Rangers, it makes sense. They needed, you know, Filipino being out for the whole year. They needed a bottom six guy. Mm-hmm. And you look at Jack Roslevic. I, lo- I like this kid a lot. Uh, Columbus, he was traded from, I think it was – Winnipeg, uh, not Winnipeg. Was it Winnipeg? Winnipeg to Columbus, I think. Okay. Yeah, he was in the Pat- I think he was in the Patrick Line deal. If I'm not, I, I don't remember exactly you. what happened. But he's a Columbus. <laughs> he's a Columbus native, and I'm just going to babble about it. But no, he was. He's a Columbus native, playing for his hometown Columbus team. Mm. Um, obviously, Columbus has been terrible, and I think for him, he's a great young player, tons of skill. And they go and get Chad Ruedel, um, which to me, another move like an Islander, the Islanders could have done. Get a depth veteran guy. He's in his 30s. He's been around. He's been a depth defenseman. He knows where it takes. He's probably one of their better defensive defensemen now that the Rangers have. A lot of their guys are more offense. You know, Lindgren obviously is the definition of a defensive defenseman, but the solid just addition to get in case, you know, depth. He's going to be a seventh guy, but God forbid someone gets hurt for no, you know, very small price. They're bringing a guy. That's something I think the Islanders could have done for sure. Right on. And unless you have anything else to add on the trade deadline, I'm going to move on and tell everybody about Main Street Board Game Cafe. Go for it. Main Street Board Game Cafe in Huntington Village on Long Island's North Shore. Games for sale and for open play. Food and drink, beer and wine, fun and friends. Bring the magic of phones down, eyes up, tabletop board games to your family. Our staff will help you find the right game from old favorites to the hottest new releases. We have everything from strategic to easy party games. Get off your screens for a night your family will remember. Looking for meetups to join? Our Magic the Gathering, Dungeons and Dragons, Lorcana, and organized play communities are welcoming for all. We also do parties and corporate events. Located at 307 Main Street in Huntington Village. Go to MainSTBoardGameCafe.com for more information. Main Street Board Game Cafe. Find your crowd. Unplug your game. And with that, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we're going to go to What's on Tap. I hear it. It's over. I can't believe they fell short again. Yeah, but they played so well. They made it to the semifinals two years in a row. The semifinals aren't the cup. God damn it. Heat those lightning. They'll get another shot at it next year. I don't even want to talk about it anymore, all right? They lost, okay? Let me just sit here and enjoy the one thing that makes me a little bit happy. This fresh, delicious, tasty, meaty, turkey-filled blue line combo. Eat three every, every keep me strong. Hey, Donnie, can I set up? Talk about a blast from the blue line. Blue Line Deli and Bagels. Our goal is to make you a hero. Attention all artists, storytellers, and creators of all kinds. It's time to make your content stand out above the rest. And Floored Media is the place to make your visions become a reality. Maybe you want to elevate your podcast and add some video. Or turn that novel you wrote into an audiobook. Or maybe you just need the right space to produce your daily vlog. Whether you're a seasoned veteran or just starting out, Floored Media has the professional facilities, exceptional staff, and intimate atmosphere to breathe life into your creative passions at every step of the process. It's time for What's on Tap, brought to you by A1 VIP Entertainment. All right, folks, it's time for What's on Tap. we got a busy week ahead, starting with tomorrow. The Islanders go into Anaheim to play the former Mighty Ducks. And then Monday night, they go into L.A. to round out the road trip out west before facing Buffalo. But let's start with Anaheim. We'll talk about the rest of the games. Uh, Stefan, another game similar to the San Jose Sharks game where they got to take care of business. What do you see happening there? Yeah, uh, Anaheim Ducks are where they are because of lack of consistency, because of injuries, and just not being a great team. Uh, four or five and one in their last ten games. We don't know if Trevor Zegers will be back. He's been practicing. That's obviously got to watch. But if you remember the Islanders last year, one they went on their they started their run on this trip. Um, again, it didn't go perfectly clear. They had the other team to lose them to make the playoffs. But when they were in Anaheim, it was the day after. It was a back to back, second level back to back after LA, and that was the first game that Engvall, Palmieri, and Nelson played together was in the Honda Center, and they went off. I forgot the exact score of the game, but Palmieri had two goals. That whole line clicked, and that line essentially carried the Islanders into the playoffs. They went on a run last year after this game. So for the Islanders, again, and they're in a similar spot where they got to keep winning. This is a, a Ducks team that struggles to keep the puck out of their own net. They have some offensive talent. 
don't get me wrong, but for the Islanders, again, if they just play their game, there's a reason why the Ducks are where they are, whether they're facing Dostal, the backup, or Gibson, the starter. I mean, you just put them to work, and eventually they're going to crack. Gibson's a very good goalie. Dostal's a very good goalie. But like we said with Sorokin, where you have so much pressure every game, you know, you're going to fall at one point. You're, it's going to open up. So for the Islanders, they got to keep doing what they're doing. That Palmieri, again, that line's not together anymore, but I'm looking at that second line again, the, the Lee um, Pagel Palmieri line, which has been starting the last couple of games. To keep going again, Palmieri played with the Ducks probably, what, 10 years ago. Um, so he loves, it's special to be back in this building. He's had success with the Islanders in this building. So I'm looking at him as another guy to have another game where he just pops off because. Again, not what that one person can carry an entire team, but a strong start from that line especially, getting a goal maybe on their first shift will go a long way for the Islanders. Keeping on the gas, getting another win and extending that win streak. Yeah, without a doubt. And Palmieri has just been fantastic since Patrick Waugh has taken over. I know you've noted it. And by extension, that line, it's kind of revitalized J.G. Pajot. And it's just yep. him, he getting points on the board. He's looking a lot better there. And Anders Lee obviously factoring in as well. So, I mean, look, it doesn't matter who's really leading the charge as long as they're putting more goals up than the other team. But again, like the San Jose game, this is a team you got to win. You got to beat, especially when you're, you're trying to get back into the playoff picture and they're nearly there. So then let's move on to Monday. The competition gets a little tougher here. They go into LA, they play the Kings. They don't get Linus Allmark, but this is a tough team. This is a, a team that's competing up in the, in the Western conference. So what do you see in LA? LA. Yeah, later to my honors where they fired their head coach, uh, former Islanders assistant, I'm blanking the name at the moment, is now the interim head coach, former power play goal guy for them. Oh, Hiller, right? Was it Hiller? Hiller, yeah, Hiller yes. is their assist. Hiller's their head coach now. They're uh, six, three, and one in their last 10. They've been playing a lot better, and they're third in the Pacific. And this is not an easy division by any means. Um, and Or the West is not easy at all. I mean, you have Nashville and Vegas as your as your wildcard teams right now. So they have a lot of pressure, just keep on winning and trying to figure out a way to find more consistency in their game. But yeah, they're a desperate team as well. And when you play a desperate team, it's very different than playing a team that's not playing for anything, which I think actually bodes better for the Islanders. You look at teams that are playing for nothing. It's really hard to guess what they're going to do. Sure. For example, the Sharks aren't going to do what a team that's in a playoff spot is going to do in terms of sitting back in moments or say, making the simple play. Like the Sharks are just going to go for it because it doesn't matter. Um, so I think for the Islanders, it's even better to play a team that's in a playoff spot because it makes it in anticipation a little easier. We know they're going to dump and change in, in the second period with a couple. Like, we know what they're going to do. But for the Islanders, again, it's back to just playing their game. You look at all the games they've had to play on this win streak now. And again, big wins against Boston, things like that. But they play the Sharks. They're going to play bad Anaheim Ducks. And this is another huge test. For Obviously, if they beat the Ducks. It's an important win to keep the streak going. But Second of a back-to-back. -back. Sorokin not playing against Anaheim, so he should be rested. How is this team going to look against a team that's a playoff team? And a team that's probably has as much on the line as, I mean, even the Islanders, again, I know where LA is in the standings, but, you know, the wild card National Predators have 77 points. LA's in third place in the Pacific with 75. So these points are huge for the LA Kings. So it'll be interesting to see how the Islanders fare against them. But same thing, whoever you're playing against, whether it's Talbot, Corpusala, whatever it is, mm -hmm. Go get them going to work. You know, Talbot had an amazing start to the year, and the LA Kings kind of fell off, and he fell off with them. And that's a goal that's a veteran guy, an older guy. Get him moving. Get him getting moving side to side, getting the bodies in front. Look at Omar. You know, the Islanders, that's a very good goaltender in Omar. And was his rebound control great? No, but the Islanders forced the issue. They right. realized from the first shot that his rebound control was weak. So for Talbot, again, Omar's a bigger guy. He's not moving as much. Talbot's not the best mobile guy get them moving again especially when you're going to play the night before you need to be on the attack as early as possible because if you sit back and let the kings play their game you're gonna have a hard time if the honors usually they say teams in the second or back to back usually have a strong first period because they got their legs and things going but the honors for them is i can score first and get a pet a lead a little bit maybe a two or three goal lead going into the second or even the third mm -hmm. when they do get tired because they will be tired especially with the west coast travel give themselves a little bit of cushion there. But I think for the Islanders, it's it's a team that's a very big test to go up against an LA Kings team, especially with rumors like Pierre Dubois, seeing if he steps up, knowing that he was potentially being on the move or other players being on the move. It's huge to prove to the GM that, hey, you not making those moves, like there's a reason you didn't make those moves. Thanks for not making those moves. Rather than if a team, you know, a team trade like the LA Kings, trading a player like that, who knows what that does for this group. So for the guys that are still here that are trying to make, you know, Cali have an RFA that was rumored to be potentially on the move. 
see them, you know, step up now for their team down the stretch. So this will be a good matchup for the Islanders. For sure. And just to save time at the end for questions, Bruin, let's breeze a little bit through the, the next few here. You got Thursday, the Islanders going to Buffalo. Saturday, the dreaded afternoon game against the Ottawa Senators. I believe that's a 12-30 start. That's going to be a tough one. Mm -hmm. And then Sunday, big day, has, has much more implications now than just bragging rights here, right? The Islanders are going to be fighting for a playoff spot against a, a, a top team here in the New York Rangers. That's going to be at Madison Square. Square Garden. That's a 1 p.m. puck drop. And of course, ladies and gentlemen, we got the viewing party going on at RJ Daniels in Rockville Center. 12 o'clock pregame show. We'll have the game on. We'll have the sound on. Plenty of TVs. Mikey Carver will be my special guest co-host as Stefan covers the game over at MSG. We're going to have our pals from the Rangers Ed podcast hanging out with us. We're going to have a lot of fun. Giveaways, prizes, raffles. It's going to be a great, great time. So come on down for a little St. Patrick's Day battle. So that will do it for what's on tap. And now I'm going to tell you what else is on tap from A1 VIP Entertainment featured events. Friday, March 22nd, Fallout Boy at MSG, as well as Saturday, March 30th, and Sunday, March 31st, Zach Bryan at UBS Arena. And folks, baseball season is around the corner, and A1 VIP can get you 50% off select Yankee games this season. Just call 516-787-0048. Mention Hockey Night in New York for 10% off those featured events and of course to ask about those 50% off seats for the Yankee games one call does it all and now I'm going to tell you about Isles Fix. Islanders country, get your daily fix of Isles news, highlights, and analysis by subscribing to Isles Fix, the only Monday through Friday Islanders newsletter sent directly to your inbox. Sign up for free or become a paid subscriber for added benefits at islesfix.substack.com. And with that, we're going to take one more break. When we come back, we'll hit the hero of the week, and then we'll close it out with questions, Bruins. So thank you guys so much for tuning in to twitch.tv slash hockey night NY. We'll be right back. Gentlemen, when you hear this song, that means it's time for the Hero of the Week, brought to you by the Blue Line Deli and Bagels Half Price Hero, which this week is the Hockey Night in New York, featuring grilled chicken, buffalo sauce, mozzarella cheese, avocado in a delicious wrap. And to start us off, folks, I'm going to give you my Hero of the Week, and that is none other than my co-host here at Hockey Night in New York, Mr. Stefan Rosner, kicking ass covering the aisles, covering the Metropolitan teams here over at the hockey news doing a great job and uh even though he's not in the studio here tonight he's hanging out with us out in california but he's a workhorse he just keeps busting his ass so big ups to stefan rosner and he conveniently fits in the sean's pick window there <laughs> for hero of the week so stefan uh, you can't see it. pumping you up happy birthday love the shades uh you're my hero pal what do you got to say about that you can't, you can't see it but i'm tearing up so um <laughs> that's why you wore this i appreciate that uh, yeah i appreciate that a lot that means means everything do do appreciate that and the support is always and thanks for uh firing christian um my hero is uh no kidding kidding maybe um yeah my hero time yeah yeah you're up buddy what do you got all right yeah so i'm going with jean gabriel pageau now i do want to include the boston game because again it was a week later but he had two assists against Boston, and so far he's got points in three straight games. He has a goal and three assists. His goal against St. Louis has actually tied the game, which allowed Horvat to take the lead. Big goal from him. What that line's done, even if Pajot hasn't gotten the assists, the tertiary assists, the big defensive plays, the penalty kill has been a lot better on this win streak. Pajot has played a huge part in that. And I think the biggest question when the lines got changed was Pajot, after coming over at 2020, was an offensive player for Ottawa. And they've groomed him in being this defensive shutdown guy. 
could he kind of rediscover an offensive game with vets? I mean, this is like the first time he's playing alongside two vets. I mean, sure, he was there with Parise for the last couple right. of years, but they had Holmstrom, they had Wallstrom, Good point. and Kiefer Bellow. Yeah. Like, you look back, and I think, no joke, since he's joined the team, it's been like north of 100 and something different line combinations. Um, and I think even this year he's played with a handful. So for him, it's like, could he be an offensive player? And you're seeing it, you know, after those first two games with the new lines, maybe, yeah, maybe it was going to be not so much. And you're seeing it now. And I think that's huge for the honors. We talk about how that top line couldn't carry the offense. They need the depth scoring. And this second line has been fundamentally very strong. Anders Lee looks a lot better with Pajot. He looks a lot faster. Yeah. Pajot's being that defensive guy. It's not like he's not playing defense, but – you know, he's allowed Palmieri and those guys to get up on the rush a lot more. I think this has been a match made in heaven. I thought the Sadiqas Engvall pairing was, oh, this is going to be the pairing that we get surprised about. But Pajot being a top six forward for the first time in four years, he's, he's figuring out that the offense is there at some point. And that's huge as well. One, if you want to drive up his value, whether it's at the draft or at some point moving him, so they can still play offense is huge. But for what the Islanders want to do right now, Getting Pajot going offensively is so critical. And the fact that he's doing it without sacrificing the defense is even more important. Yeah, I've said it here before. I had my doubts about this line, even just the rest of the forward lines, right? After he, he went, uh, Patrick yeah. Wall went top heavy with, with the centers, right? So to see not only Palmieri coming out here, but also, you know, hearing Pajot's name, because I feel like he's just kind of flown under the radar a lot this season because he just wasn't involved in the scoring. We even talked about how his faceoff percentage has gone down. So it's great to see that this is kind of a revitalization for him. And credit to Patrick Wah for putting that line together and, and having some confidence in him because it's it's really paying off so good pick there with Pajot and and if I was going to give an honorable mention uh because after picking you Stefan <laughs> I would say Bo Horvat after having that game winner against St. Louis he has a goal and two assists against against the Sharks so he had a, had himself a good week as well so there you have it folks JG Pajot and Stefan Rosner are your heroes of the week and with that we're going to check in with the snake over the snake den welcome to the snake den with Jake the Snake Redux. I love that intro. Anyway, <laughs> Jake, filling in Fredzo there behind the board. How are we doing, pal? I'm doing good. Who is that guy talking? I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> Somebody with the company hired him. He just he did, a, did a great job. Yeah, he, did he great definitely job. did a great job. So how's your pal Jay doing over there? I'm doing good, you know. He's, he's been smiling a lot yeah, tonight. Yeah, smiling I have to and laughing. <laughs> I have to mention He that. really does hate uh, Ed, doesn't he? <laughs> <laughs> we're doing good, yeah. We, we built some rapport back here. I, I love that. that. Yeah, it looked yeah. like you guys were getting along. Oh, wow. That's great. Look at that. <laughs> friendly on. affection. All right, Jake. So let's hear it. What do you got here? Yeah, so... Um, um, a few weeks ago, I had talked about the trade deadline and if the Islanders were to stand pat, that I actually wouldn't be totally against that. And, and here we are. Yep, that's exactly what they did. And I still think it might be the right decision here. Um, I said that I'd like to see how this group plays under mm -hmm. Wah. And this is a time that he could really use to evaluate his roster. And look, look what's happening right now. This team's playing lights out. Yeah. Five-game win streak. You have a couple games coming up that you must win. Sure. So... Hey, if he's evaluating the roster and this team gets into the playoffs and makes some noise during that, cool. Double whammy. All right. So Jake's doubling down on stand and pat. Steph, uh, Stefan, if you want to add to that a little bit, then we'll go into questions brewing. Yeah, before questions brewing, the standing pat part. Yeah, this group under Wa on this win streak, the, the amount of goals you're getting from everybody. I mean, I'm looking at the – I just want to do some stats here. First off, Kyle Mary leads the way with four goals. Um, but then you have Matthew Barzal, three goals. Bo Horvat, three goals. Brock Nelson, three goals. This isn't just five on five. I'm just going through the list. McLean, two goals. Anders Lee, two goals. Romanov, a goal. Dobson, a goal. Aho, a goal. Engvall, a goal. I mean, everyone, it's like Oprah. Up and you down get a goal. You get a goal. Everybody's scoring. In terms of point-wise, sure, again, Brock Nelson, Horvat, and Barzal leading the way. Eight, seven, and six in that order. But Palmieri, six. Lee, three. Uh, Lee, five. Dobson, four. Pulak, four. Pelik, four. All right, you just said three defensemen are all getting points. I think that's so important when we talk about depth scoring is that you need your defense to score goals for you. Um, one player does not have a point on this five-game uh, win streak. One player. Who, who, and that's who Cal that? Clutterbuck. Ah, okay. Cal Clutterbuck okay. is the only player without a point. Everybody else has at least one. That tells you a lot. That, again, sure. when you could run, it's so cliche, when you could run four lines and have run three defense pairings, how good you could be, but... We are seeing how good this Islanders team is. Again, it goes back to this group has no talent. They can't do it. It's like, <laughs> no, because the arguments were crazy. On so Again, I get arguing with people. Like The team was playing bad. 
Um, but we again, you look at this roster and go, there's too much. They have enough talent. This should not be a team that's struggling to score defensively. They've played this game. They know how to do it. No, they're too old. They can't figure it out. You're seeing underwater now. Again, can they continue this long run into the playoffs? And that's obviously a question. But they're playing the way they're playing right now. They are an unbeatable team when they could do what they're doing. And that goes back to they are a talented group. It's getting the most out of them. And Patrick Waugh has certainly done that. And they're buying in. And they're again the accountability thing where we're putting the top. I mean, I think every player knew when that top line gets put together that we got to pick it up ourselves. You know, can't you know? There's more accountability on us now that hey, Waugh's doing this, trusting enough that we could figure it out and fill the offense down the lineup. You know, the fans on the outside are going, this is too much. The players are going, all right, they're showing trust in us that the offense right. can still work with those our top three forwards being on the same line. You're seeing up and down the lineup, key pieces, and again, the defense coming through to get points and goals is so important. Yeah, and none of us here are sitting here and trying to tell you that they couldn't have benefited from bringing somebody in at the deadline. Yeah. But when you look at the hurdles that that had to be kind of leaped to make that happen, made it a little tougher. I'm sure Lou would have loved to add somebody there. I'm sure we all would have loved to see a little more depth, maybe the surprise score or two. I would have been happy to see Duclair. Jake had mentioned that in the previous snake then. But at the same time, to your point, Stefan, this is a team who does have a lot of talent. Am I going to sit here and say it's a Stanley Cup contending team? Probably yeah. not. But... Let's see what they do. Let's see how they do it. Because we saw what this team has done, obviously, with a little bit different personnel under Barry Trotz, and he got them there to the Final Four, right? I'm not saying this team's going there, but Patrick Waugh finally has them playing the way he wants to. They're seeing success. We'll see if it continues. But it's it's one of those weird trade deadlines for me, real quick, is that usually I go into one hoping for somebody, maybe somebody specifically, or maybe just a certain position to be filled. This is a, a rare deadline where... You know, coming out of it, seeing that they didn't do anything, I wasn't like, oh, man, I really wish they got that guy. I really, I really wish they got this guy. I'm kind of just like, all right, it didn't happen. Let's see what where it goes. Instead of being like, man, they really missed the boat on this guy or that guy. So I'm willing to see where it goes. I think we're all happy a week, two weeks later after what happened, you know, where we all thought this season was going in the tank. Now all of a sudden they're back competing. Let's see if Patrick Watt can keep having them play in the way they play. They're playing and get into the dance and see if they can make any noise. Yeah, and they've outscored opponents 24 to 10 on this five game win streak. I think the 10 goals is second fewest in the league, and the 24 goals at the top of the league over this span. And also, again, scoring goals was a major issue for this group maybe early on in the year. The offense was better, but they weren't consistently being better. I mean, they have four or more goals in four straight, and five or more goals in three or four. So this team could score goals. It was about defense. And now you're seeing when they actually play defense and are able to move the puck. I mean, it's so cliche. We keep going back to it, but why is a cliche? The best defense is offense. Spending less time in the, spending more time in the ozone means less time in the D zone. And if they could only get that top line, just spend less time in their own zone, there's even more room for offense. Cause right now that top line is, you know, there's a couple of times a game where they're stuck in there for like a minute every time. So if they can even cut down on that, I mean, this team is so dangerous offensively with the weapons they have. They don't have to be great defensively, which is what Wa said when he came in here. I don't need our – it's not a defensive system. We don't have to be elite defense. We just need our fans coming to watch us and being proud of the way we play defense, and that's what you're seeing right now. It's not elite defense. It's defense that where they're, they're playing solid enough to allow their offense to flourish. That's all they need. There you go. Let's see if it continues, and let's go in to questions brewing. It's time for questions brewing. So go ahead. Ask us a question. That's right, folks. It's time for questions brewing, and now I send it back to Jake the Snake Radonis over there. Jake, how's the chat looking? Do we have some questions coming our way? We do. The chat is very live tonight. Love it so, on a Saturday night. Thank you very much, yes. ladies and gentlemen. Appreciate that. Everyone's talking amongst themselves. Some people have some questions. All right. Uh, love to hear it. Let's let's see what we got. I do have a question for Stefan first. Oh, okay. How's the weather over there, buddy? <laughs> Uh, it's sunny. It's sunny. It's warm. It's not too hot, which is great. I uh, I actually was staying in LA, so I drove to Anaheim. It was about an hour each way. And uh, the drive, first off, LA traffic might be as bad as Long Island traffic, so they're comparable for sure. Um, but yeah, it's a I love I love LA. The weather out here is great. And then we go to Buffalo, so hopefully I bring the warm weather to Buffalo at the end of this week. But not yeah, feeling good. Uh, the glasses, I feel really good on. I don't wear sunglasses often, so this is the time to shine. Well, they look pun great. intended. They look great. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, it's a good look, Stefan. Maybe that's something we can keep up uh, <laughs> as we go forward here. But, uh, Jake, why don't you kick us off with a question? All right. So, first up is from Mike4652Co. 
do you think the coaching staff do see they are a better team without Mayfield in the lineup? Stefan, I'll let you hit that one. Uh, did, did the coaching staff see it? I mean, again, it, how do you want to value Scott Mayfield? It's clear that he's been hurt all year since game one of the season. So I think if Mayfield was able to come back for the playoffs, great. Ajo has been fantastic. And in last year's playoffs, he was their second best defenseman behind Pulak, my opinion. That being said, we know where Ajo's flaws are when it becomes a physical brand of hockey. Now, again, is Ajo a better option right now than a not 100% Scott Mayfield who's making – um, who's making a little bit amount of mistakes. Yeah, obviously, you'd rather have a healthy guy that could play to his potential than a guy in Mayfield who's slugging around out there because he isn't healthy. Now, I'm not, you know, Mayfield has to be accountable with the way he played and the mental mistakes he made this year. It wasn't just because of an ankle injury. But that being said, it seems like that he was trying to, trying to do too much to you because of the ankle, where I'm going to make a different pass because I, maybe I can't get up the ice the way I wanted. So I think if Mayfield is ready for the playoffs, I do think you'll see him in over Ajo just because a big body shot blocking guy. Now that depends if Portuzo comes in for Ajo. We'll see what happens. Um, that being said, though, I don't know if Mayfield's going to be back. He's shut down for four to six weeks, and then surgery will be decided. I could so see them thinking, you know what? We could rush him back for the playoffs. We do have Bortuzzo, who plays a Mayfield role. Let, Mayfield's under contract for another six years. We need him healthy for the start of next year. So I, I wouldn't be shocked to see after the four to six week evaluation – they're going to say, you know what, the best thing short-term and long-term is to shut them down. Um, so that being said, it doesn't really matter what the coaching staff thinks. I think if it came down to it, it's just about playoff hockey, and Mayfield's a better fit for playoff hockey than having Ajo in there. But that being said, Ajo's played well. Maybe he deserves a shot. I think Stefan covered that thoroughly. Jake, next. Cool. From uh, MJ Beckman, how concerned should we be with Sorokin's rebound control? Seems to be giving up a lot more uh, big rebounds rather than absorbing and holding the puck. Stephanie, yeah, the goalie. I'm sorry. One more. Uh, Sorokin's rebound control. Yeah, that's been an issue all year with him. And I think this helps. I'm not concerned about the rebound control as much anymore because I have more trust in the defense to clean it up. Um, the reason that, you know, Sorokin makes all these high level saves, we talked about it because if you don't control that first rebound, you have to be, like you have to make a high level save because you're out of position. So I think the best thing for us, what we want to see from Sorokin now going forward is Simple nights. And when I say simple, I always look back to one game. I don't couldn't tell you the year it was. It was a game where Chad Johnson was in goal for the Islanders. Because oh I remember God. my goalie coach the next morning. Where I'll, there's, a, there's a point to this. The next morning, I have my goalie coach. And he said, did you watch the Islanders? And it was Chad Johnson. He made 18 saves in the game. It was a 2 nothing shutout win. And he was like, what would you notice? I'm like, pretty boring game. He goes, exactly. He goes, why was that boring for Chad Johnson? And I remember the lesson. Like It was yesterday. And I'm like, because he did, what did he do right? He controlled his rebounds. Correct. He had, did not have to make one flashy save because everything was held on to. Everything was to the corners, things like that. So that's what you want to see from Sorokin now with the defense being as shut down as it's ever been since Trotz left at this point in time is not that many rebounds. And he should, again, less better in defensive form means less screens, which means you could track the puck better, which should mean less rebounds. So I think I wouldn't be concerned now because I think the defense is good enough to bail Sorokin out, whereas when he didn't control his rebounds, he had to bail himself out. And that's more chaos for the defense when you're not controlling your rebounds. Again, it goes back to the whole theme of this kind of episode about Sorokin is just do your job. Don't worry about making that secondary save. Focus on making the first save because you don't even have to make a second save if you make the right play and the right reads and the you track the puck in the first time. So I don't think we'll have to worry about his rebound controls as much because even if there are rebound controls, because outside shots usually do produce rebounds to the slots, the team is aware of that, that they'll clean up a lot more. There you go, Jake. Next. All right, we got a little bit of confidence here from T. Boyle. What? Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what? Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry, let me read He doesn't want Malkin to sell the team? Right. No, no, no. So, Let's see it. Okay. T. Boyle said, an Islanders-Rangers series is a real possibility now. I feel the Islanders will yeah. beat them. Do you guys agree? I think it would be uh, a hell of a series. I would love to see it. Obviously, the Rangers would be the heavy favorite. But any, as we know, anything can happen in an Islander Ranger regular season game, and I would think the same would go for a playoff series. And I know there's a, a lot of Islander fans nervous about that prospect, but I say bring it on. I hope Gensel and Kuznetsov brings Carolina to first place. The Rangers drop down to second. The Islanders take over third from Philly. Give me the Rangers in the first round, and let's just see where the chips fall. Because I, I, I we have, I've been dying for this. I know a lot of people have been dying for this. Like, let's see the Islanders and Rangers. Uh, kick off a, a first round series. Let let Martin and Rempe go at it to, <laughs> before at the drop of the puck. Let it go to Game Seven, triple overtime. We'll all lose our you know we'll all lose our collective shite. But uh, 
Do I think that the Islanders can win that series? I do. Do I think they'd be favored to win? Of course not. But I definitely think that the Islanders could win that series, and I'd be very curious to see if it came down to the goaltending battle between Sorokin and Shesterkin, because if anything, I think Sorokin has a better advantage over Shesterkin just because he seems like a more cool, calm, collected individual in those settings. Islander fans are going to love this one. Well, first off, they're going to hate this, bringing up 2020, though, where the Islanders could have faced the Rangers before COVID, like that whole playoff series because of yeah. that high stick that wasn't called. Remember that Svechnikov high stick led to the Trotrek overtime. By point percentage, that would have had the Islanders playing the Rangers if the Islanders got the two points. Uh, but anyway, this is the take they're going to like, is that Rangers are a bad five-on-five five team. A very bad five-on-five five team. Islanders right now, with the way things are going, very good five on five team. So if the Islanders could play that series, not being in the penalty box, I actually would put it more on the Islanders winning that series and playoff hockey. It's forget about overtime. Everyone complains. Well, you know, loser points, you go to the playoffs, you know, you have to play those teams. If it goes to overtime, it's five on five hockey. So actually I think the Islanders would have the advantage because they're a better five on five team. Um, but again, if they get into penalty trouble, the Rangers power play can come through and absolutely kill them and wipe them away. Like most playoff series, if you're in the box more often than not, we saw against the Hurricanes last year. Like, you don't come through on the power play. What were they, one for 18 in that series or one for 10, whatever it was? And the Canes felt like they scored every game on the power play. So I do think the Islanders would have the advantage. I really do because of 5-on-5 five five, they stay out of the box. If they stay out of the box is the key. Because even though, as you said earlier, Stefan, the penalty kill has looked better, I'm still not convinced that, that – you know, they're they're over the hump there. I need to see more out of this PK over the next, you know, 20 games that we have left in the season, and hopefully they keep trending that way. But, Jake, you, you got one more for us? I do. So this one's from NZAB09. What are your realistic expectations with the Islanders playing the way they are and the teams who have added at the deadline? Playoffs? First-round exit? Second-round exit? I, if you don't mind, Stefan, I'll start. I think yeah. the Islanders, and it's so funny – what a difference a week or two makes. But I think the Islanders are nearly a shoe in for the playoffs at this point. They have, I said it before, they have three paths to take here. I think the easiest path is actually going to be Philadelphia in that third spot. And I think, like, if the Islanders don't make the playoffs, it's going to be their own fault because Tampa mm-hmm. Bay looks human. Philadelphia already does. I think they're losing or lost today. I think I saw a score update. update for nothing. We, there you go. Getting trounced right there, right? Well, t- t- Tampa beat the Flyers for nothing, and Torello was ejected. So. Oh, wow. I love that. <laughs> but but I I actually like that outcome. I would rather the Islanders chase the Flyers. No, agreed. So but they and then they also have Detroit there too, and they have some games in hand on these teams. It looks like they're playing the right way. Could things you know fall off the tracks and, and get derailed? Look, we've been watching this season. We saw what these players on the ice have done, and and it took a long time for anybody to feel good about this team, right? And we're finally there. So I think we're all a little cautiously optimistic. But I have a good feeling that things are going to continue to go better as opposed to worse from here on out. So I think they're making the playoffs at this point. And then it's just a matter of how they get in in the sense that will they still be riding, you know, let's say a, a 12, 6, and 4 streak, you know, however the numbers, you know, add up. But if they're riding hot in there then and, and they get the Rangers in the first, first round or maybe they get a chance of revenge against Carolina, that's the way it would look to me now. I think they got a shot. I'm not going to sit here and say, oh, yeah, they're they're easily getting through the first or second round. But I think this is a team you can't count out if they're playing the way they're playing with the guys that they have, the goaltender that they have. We, we've seen it when they went when they went deep under Barry Trotz, right? Nobody expected those teams to go where they went. But they played as a cohesive unit. They kept the pucks out of the net. They had the goaltending, and they had the time, timely scoring. So I believe it can happen. It's just a matter of whether they can make it happen. Unlike the Barry Trotz years, unlike the year when they made it under Lane, the Islanders, I don't remember the last time they went into the playoffs on a, a bender, like on a hot streak. Right. Um, again, I don't remember the last time that's happened. I don't know how, uh, obviously, you want to go in as hot as possible, but we have never seen, and I don't understand that so big on momentum now with Wah, carry that into a playoff. That would be interesting to see. Um, and the, the best thing about that question that was asked is first round question marks. That's the whole point is you have no idea once you make it. Um, so we can't sit here and say what's going to happen. Obviously, we don't know, but. That's the beauty of the playoffs. Anything could possibly happen. If the Honors win against the Ducks tomorrow, they tie the Flyers in points. Now, I'm pretty sure the Flyers are the tiebreaker. Regulation wins. Yeah. But that makes the game against L.A. huge because if they beat L.A. and the Flyers lose their next game, 
the playoffs being in the playoffs is now back in the Islanders' hands. You can say it is in their hands now because you're expecting the Flyers to fall off, but mathematically, once the Islanders get in front of the Flyers, it is now on them to make the playoffs. If they miss the playoffs, it is completely on them. If they make the playoffs, it's obviously it's on them. But the whole time this year, we could never say, well, it's in their own hands. They've been playing catch-up. Now they're going to be in a situation if they do beat um, the Ducks and the Flyers lose the next game to get ahead of them. The Islanders for the remainder, what, 17 games after that? They are controlling their own destiny, and that's important. That's an important part of this. That's the main point for me is that I think that the Islanders are in the driver's seat now because they have three vulnerable options ahead of them, and they're already right there. So it's really the Islanders' own fault if they don't get in. And then I think anything can happen after that, and I think uh, we can sneak one more in, Stefan? Yeah, we can sneak one more. Cool. Cool. Well, I feel like I have to do this one because this is my mom asking the question. Hey, yeah. all right. So, always wanted to say hi, mom, on the camera. <laughs> there so, we there go. You go. Uh, <laughs> she asked, <Yeah. laughs> she asked, not to get ahead of ourselves, but what playoff match should the Isles fear the most? Are we talking like opening playoff? round here? Yeah. Okay, Stefan, why don't you go first? Fear no, but no. I'm trying to think of who <laughs> I like they that. fear the most. <laughs> um honestly it's such a cliche answer maybe a, I, if i'm the honors i don't fear anybody now again yeah. they're not going to end up there are certain teams that are not going to end up playing so we don't like there's no point in talking about because they're not going to obviously finish as a number one seed things like that but sure i wouldn't be bad i wouldn't be terrified with carolina because of their goaltending i wouldn't be terrified against the rangers because of their bad five on five play honestly you know what florida Thank that you. would be the team that you don't want to face. sorry i was <laughs> i was blanking yeah Florida. nobody if you play florida you are Again, it's one thing. At you can always have the upsets. To me, Florida is making it back to the Cup final, um, and I'd put money on it if if the odds are probably better, where I can get more money back. Because right now they have to be favorites to go back. They're just right. up and down that lineup. So talented. The broth has been great all year. That would be the only team if I'm the Islanders that I'd like to avoid. Now that being said, it would be cool for the Islanders to play a Poso in the playoffs um, for the storyline there. But outside of Florida, I wouldn't be terrified to play anybody. Yeah, I think the the three real options here are probably the Rangers, Florida, or Carolina, right? I don't know how well they they you know with the the way the standings go. I guess like I, without even looking, at it, I don't know if even know if Boston could could catch you know Florida at this point. And I guess they could they couldn't end up playing Boston if Florida finished first because then you have the the two division winners, right? So I think we're looking at Rangers, Carolina, and the Panthers. And yeah, I want no part of Florida in the first round. Like, obviously, if you want to get all the way, you eventually got to go through them. But uh, I'd rather a first round matchup against the Rangers or the Carolina Hurricanes. I've obviously already said my piece about the Rangers series. And either one would be tough. And especially with Carolina stacking the deck a little bit, making those moves, they're a team that's dangerous. But Stefan also pointed out their vulnerabilities. So, you know, give me either revenge against Carolina or uh, a, a dream first round series against the Rangers and then take it from there. Stephen? Well done. That was a great answer. <laughs> yeah, I, was, I mean, there's something to add there. I do want to add that they can't. Um, there is something to add, actually. Like, Toronto has a set, uh, eight point lead over Detroit and Tampa. I mean, that would be a catastrophic if they end up as a wild card spot. So, realistically, yeah, you're looking at Carolina Rangers or Florida. And I guess they could end up – no, they really can't. That would be it. So, I think, yeah, Florida is a juggernaut. Definitely yeah. playing the Rangers would be – probably matchup-wise, you talk about that would be a great, fun matchup. But I think they still have the leg up on Carolina as well. I mean, they could have beaten Carolina last year. If, again, if they stay out of the box and a couple of quirky goals don't go in. But you said they had it up front, which is great. But at the end of the day, playoffs are about keeping the puck out of your own net. And if you don't have the great goaltending, I know Anderson just came back, and good for him with that blood clot. But that's always going to be a question mark, and that's always where most teams in the playoffs are vulnerable. Like, look at Edmonton. They're going to go as far as we can carry them, but at the end of the day, if they don't get the big stop, they're not going anywhere. For sure. So, folks, that's going to do it for Questions Brewing. If we didn't get to your question, we will try to get to it next week. And with that, we're going to wrap this thing up. So, ladies and gentlemen, want to send a big thanks to Stefan Rosner on the clock over there on the West Coast, calling in from Cali to join the show, doing a great job here co-hosting and my hero of the week. Of course, also want to send out a big thanks to all you guys out there tuning in live here at twitch.tv slash Hockey9NY, YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, everywhere. Really appreciate that. And of course, want to send a big thanks to our sponsors, starting with Blue Line Deli and Bagels. Check them out at 719 West Jericho Turnpike in Huntington and 217 Carlton Avenue in East Islip. And check out the menu at bluelinedeli.com. Also, a big thanks to Main Street Board Game Cafe, located at 307 Main Street in Huntington Village. Find out how to unplug 
plug your game at mainstboardgamecafe.com. Also want to send a big thanks to Razor and Kniff, attorneys at law. Nobody likes going to court, but hey, if you have to, call 516-742-7604, a free consultation. And last but not least, want to send a big thanks to A1 VIP Entertainment, your one-stop entertainment concierge for sports, concert, Broadway, and more. One call does it all at 516-787-0048. And of course, folks, if you haven't already, always want to ask you to rate, review, subscribe, Tell us how we're doing here at Hockey Night in New York. Stefan Rosner, where can we find you on the internet? You can find me on the map in California, but on the internet, uh, <laughs> X at Stefan underscore Rosner, S-T-E-F-E-N underscore R-O-S-N-E-R, Hockey News and NHL.com. There you go. You can follow myself on Twitter at Shawnee Hockey. You can follow the show at Hockey Night NY on all the social media platforms. And folks, one more time, I want to remind you, Big viewing party over at R.J. Daniels here in Rockville Center. Sunday afternoon pregame show with Michael Carver as my co-host. Stefan Rosner will be calling in from MSG to talk about the game, to talk about what's going on. The Rangers Ed boys will be hanging out to cover the Rangers side of things. Raffles, prizes, good times, food specials, drink specials. It's going to be a great day for St. Patrick's Day, so please come join us for that. So with that out of the way, for Stefan Rosner over there in sunny California, for Jay filling in for Jake filling in for Edzo, and Jay sitting next to him comfortably next to him with that smile on his face. I've been Sean Cuthbert. We've been Hockey Night New York. We'll see you at RJ Daniels.